This is Chris Oatley's ArtCast, episode 84, The Winding Road to Laika, an interview with Jen Ely, part two. Hello, my friends, and welcome to another episode of Chris Oatley's ArtCast, the show that goes inside the hearts and minds of successful professional artists. I'm Chris Oatley. I was a visual development artist at Disney before I quit to start my own online art school, the Oatly Academy of Concept Art and Illustration. Find more art instruction and career advice from some of the most inspiring voices in animation, games, comics, and new media at chrisoatley.com. In part one, Jen Ely regaled us with tales of alligators, emu burgers, and art school. And just as one of Jen's fellow undergrads dove into a giant cupcake for her senior exhibit, so we dove into a passionate discussion about art education. (laughs) Now in part two, Jen talks about her time at the Savannah College of Art and Design, aka SCAD, as well as her mentorship with DreamWorks production designer Kathy Altieri. But most of the episode is, as promised, about her time at Laika. A quick side note, I highly recommend a read through the comments thread for part one of this interview. It's super good. You can find it at chrisoatley.com forward slash je1 as in Jen Ely and the number one. And of course, you can find the comments for this episode, part two, at chrisoatley.com forward slash je2. Please drop by after the show and join the conversation in the comments. Now here's part two of my interview with Jen Ely. What I knew was that when I worked with other people, I just liked the feedback. I like giving the feedback and getting the feedback. and, And it taught me to really be hard on myself, to really look at things. Uh, with a critical eye. And I thought, well, I'd love to go back to school, but I had, you know, I hated that first experience. So I thought, <laughs> am, I cra- am I crazy? Like, why am I wanting to go back to school? What am I trying to get out of this? And then I thought, well, in my mind, it was like, I need the MFA and maybe I'll go back to school for illustration because that's a lot closer to what I'm doing. And also make sure that I pick a place that's a lot less avant-garde about what they're trying to do. Right. They're a lot more commercial. They're a lot more specifically directed toward like the financial side of it and getting jobs and promoting the school and all that, which SCAD really fit the mold for that for me because they make no secret of being like a marketing, (laughs) you know, marketing, commercial, enterprising organization. They have a fine art area, of course, but they really promote the heck out of that place. And, uh, and they, and the work is really good. And the work is really good. Yeah. And SCAD has a pretty, reputable Mm -hmm. illustration MFA program. So I went over there and, um, I met some great, great teachers and, and some great people that I still talk to and all of that. But I, I was certainly frustrated in that the program at that time. Now I think it's changing and I think, um, there are actually more classes now directed toward concept art. Uh, and there were almost none at that point. But um, the illustration department at that time was very focused on editorial uh, yeah. and advertising right. and freelance kind of stuff. And again, nothing wrong with that. But uh, about right. halfway through, I took a, <laughs> I took a concept course, the only concept course that existed, uh, which was in the sequential art department. And that really opened my eyes. It was like a light bulb moment. It was the summer of 2011. And I realized that's what I wanted to do. And it was like, again, light bulb moment. I then looked into, I'm like, okay, I got a year left and I've just completely changed what I want to do. (laughs) (laughs) And now I'm terrified. And so I looked into who was going to be visiting SCAD over the next year, whatever thing, you know, whatever was booked. And then I also looked at what I had left because again, like you have certain classes that you're supposed to take that you have to take. And I was lucky. I was like, oh, I've got this class coming up. That's basically an independent study. Um, guided by the head of illustration. And when I took that class, I, I proposed that I would do this this concept art stuff and he could not have been less interested. <laughs> so it was like, man, what am I going to do? 
And um, I had gone to a talk with this uh, professor named Mia Goodwin. Yeah, she's amazing. She's so amazing. Yeah. And uh, I just remember really liking her talk. Uh, she was really, really passionate and, uh, you know, opinionated all of those great things that yeah. I love. And um, I emailed her. I'm like, hey, we don't know each other. <laughs> and mm-hmm. I'm not in any of your classes. And I'm not in your department. But uh, I have this independent study coming up. But the professor's not really that interested in what I want. This is kind of what I'm interested in. You're the only one I've heard talk about right. something close to this. Can we meet? Can I talk with you? I was thinking like we would meet and like she would maybe give me a little bit of feedback on right. creating that class for myself. <laughs> I met her and we spent four hours yeah. just like talking about everything about like how it was going to work and how she was going to work with me basically through the rest of my career there at SCAD and like what the plan was going to be and who's coming to SCAD. And it was absolutely incredible. And she really influenced that whole time and gave me a lot of confidence, honestly, uh, which I needed desperately, just desperately. Yeah. She's going to be on the show. Oh, I love it. I'm really looking forward to to just getting her to tell her whole story. Yeah. She's working on an amazing new comic too. I don't know if she's told you about Tomboy, if you've seen any of this stuff, but man, it's looking great. And she does that on top of a full class load. And she, she's one of those teachers that when you go by her office at office hours, it's like, you can't get in the door. Like everybody's there. Right. I don't know about Tomboy. That sounds cool. Oh yeah. You got to ask her about it. You got to ask her about it. It's, it looks so incredible. I could not be more excited about this book. So once I decided that animation was the thing, you know, you go to the obvious places, you go to the Disney website and the DreamWorks website, you know, all right. those kinds of places to look at like, what are the jobs? And Disney was the first one that I saw that described it as visual development. I didn't even know that it was called that. <laughs> and um, right. once I saw that, I'm like, okay, but what does that mean? And I'm like Googling. And that's how I first came uh, upon chrisoli.com. Yeah, which was it, it was stellar because it so many articles and podcasts and almost every <laughs> question. That's how I found out about CTNX. It was like, man, uh-huh. oh, I got to do this thing. And that was like two months out. Wow. And I had just figured out that's what I wanted to do. And I had to make a whole portfolio. So me and I sat down and we made a plan. Every hour of every day was accounted for. I just blazed through some stuff to have something to bring to this thing because I, you know, I needed to go. Yeah, so so I remember being there and seeing you across the room and being like, oh man, I think that's Chris Oatley, but he's talking to somebody and I don't know. And it's like, no, just go, just go say hi. <laughs> <laughs> so I, and so I did. And you were actually like so sweet because I tried to run off, I think. I was like, oh, hi. You know, I, I with my, my little student high pitch voice. Um, <laughs> you, you, you talk like Minnie Mouse when you're at CTN. Yeah, exactly. Hello, that's good. Hi. Yeah, that's a good uh, tip. <laughs> I think, yeah, it, it, draws people to you everybody loves that um <laughs> that and polka dots basically the whole <laughs> my whole networking speech speech Pink as well in your hair <laughs> yeah exactly absolutely done done and done but yeah cartoon that i was i ran up to you and was so excited and uh i kind of introduced myself shook my hand said thank you and then tried to scamper away <laughs> and you immediately were like no no stay <laughs> let's, let's have a conversation i was like oh don't go oh okay <laughs> so that was really cool and um so yeah so that was that was really great and uh it was actually while i was standing in line to talk to you i ended up going back to talk to you at your booth and while i was standing in line to talk to you i saw this little green square flyer sitting on the edge of somebody's table and i just picked it up and it was the mode of uh, uh-huh. mentorship flyer uh which i ended up uh, doing that was the first year they did that. And if you're not familiar, um, uh, Motivarty, I think they do classes like workshop kind of stuff, um, down there, but they also do the mentorship program, which is like, it's a different slot of industry professionals each time. And I think they do like by the season. So maybe it's like four times a year. I'm not sure to have to check into that, but at the time, Kathy Altieri was doing one of the mentorships and, uh, she was the first artist hired at DreamWorks. Like she used to work at Disney. She was doing the background paintings and like the little mermaid and just all of my favorite, (laughs) all of my favorite things. She came over, worked on Prince of Egypt, uh, was a production designer on how to train your dragon. Like she worked on spirit. She worked on, she worked on just everything. She's incredible. Um, she's kind of like their color expert, Yeah. but I was lucky enough to get to do that mentorship with her for 10 weeks. I did one, one hour each week and we had a great time and, I learned a lot from her, obviously, as well. Some of the things that I learned from her were more about how to interact with people and how to make connections than anything else. 
And so what came next after the uh, mentorship? Well, during the mentorship, you know, people were always visiting SCAD and, um, it was actually kind of a struggle to get in front of people because we didn't have like a dedicated entertainment track or like concept art for animation kind of that didn't really exist. I did a lot of like going around trying to find the person who was going to get me in front of whoever. But one of the first things I did was go see my career advisor, (laughs) which you think like career advisor great, this is going to be the person who's going to like uh-huh. help me figure out how this is going to work and like how to get in front of these people. And I went and saw her and she didn't look at my work. Um, she asked me what I wanted to do and I told her and I was telling her the companies I was interested in, which of course were like the big visible ones because that's what I knew of at that point. And she immediately was like, okay, I'm going to need you to dial it down a couple notches. Like the likelihood is that none of that is going to be viable. And, you know... I need you to scale it back and figure out like what your other options are and that kind of thing. And I was so new to it. My zest for it was like really tempered with how naive I was to the whole um, industry that I thought, oh, if this person's telling me that, okay, well, maybe, maybe my goals are too lofty. Maybe I should, you know, that lasted, that lasted about like 30 seconds after I walked out of her office. And then I was like, started getting frustrated. Like, man what? Like, wait, what did I just let this person tell me that I need to like assume that I failed at all of these things that I want before I've even, I was like, can I fall on my face first before we assume that I'm going to trip maybe? Yeah. So, so I got really, really frustrated and I was like, okay, well, career advising isn't going to help me, whatever. That's fine. And then when I started having a lot of trouble figuring out who was making like the list of people to interview with the people who are visiting SCAD, I was like, I'm going to have to go back to the career advisor. But I was like, okay, this time's going to be different. I even like psyched myself up in the car before I went in. I'm like, okay, okay. You're not going to take no for an answer. She's going to look at your work. We're going to do this. It's going to be great. And I had been working with Kathy at this point and it was like, okay, like if this person chose me to work with for her mentorship, I'm surely good enough to at least try to get into one of these places. Yeah. And so I had worked myself up into this like forever. (laughs) I go in and the lady that I had talked to before is out sick. (laughs) And so enter Maya Smith, who was the career advisor who I absolutely adore and is a total angel, but I must have scared her to death. (laughs) You're like on the defense already. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. I I come in, I have my book in my hand. I'm like, last time I was in here, uh, the lady told me that I couldn't really go over the things that I wanted, but I'm doing this uh, mentorship with Kathy Altieri and and I've prepared all this work and I know I have a lot of work to do, but I want to get in front of these people. I said, are you going to be the person who helps me do this? Uh (laughs) And her eyes got really wide. She's like, okay, hold on. And she flips through my work. She doesn't say anything. <laughs> and then finally she goes, okay, just wait here a second. And then she leaves and I'm like, she's going to get security. She's going to, she's going to get me out of here. This girl came in yelling at her. What, you know, <laughs> she's not going to, she's not going to do anything with me. I'm a terrible person yelling at a stranger. <laughs> she, came, she came back and she's like, okay. So I talked to uh, the lady over in animation who sets, does all the interviews with the animation studios that are coming I think we're going to get you in to see Leica and DreamWorks in the next couple weeks. Like everything's going to be okay. Your work looks really good. Let's work on a resume. We can talk about that stuff. Try to calm down. Wow. <laughs> it was that's like, great. It was like, man, this is a whole different thing. Yeah. Like this is not at all what I expected when I came in here. So I got to meet with Leica, which of course was like <laughs> the most important one uh, as we all know now, but not right. at the time. And it's got the internship with them which was a total dream come true, moved out to Portland very, very soon after. <laughs> yeah, that's crazy. What I love about Leica, what I will love about Leica uh, till my dying day is that they make things with their hands and yeah. everything's a little physical object that you walk around and you can touch and you can, you know, climb on top of or whatever. And I handmade them a portfolio. I took the box that the printer paper came in as a nice box, but I, I kind of, um, I covered it in these papers and wait, I wait, 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 was it a sarcophagus? <laughs> it was not a sarcophagus. <laughs> <laughs> not at that time. Uh, <laughs> but, uh, yeah, I, I handmade, I handmade this little portfolio book to go inside with like screw posts and, wow. um, a ribbon to pull it out. And there was a special little slot that held my resume and my business card in the lid of the box. And it was, about the presentation, but more importantly, it showed 
that I understood what's unique about them. I didn't hand make right. a box for Pixar. Right. You know, what's interesting about Leica is that they make these things with such care and such craftsmanship and they, they take so much, such pride in it. And they're so unique and individual. Every single one has different little, um, little kinks and curves to it that are, uh, yeah. accidental, accidental things. So that's what I started with when I talked to her. I said, you know, I, I understand again that, Maybe I'm not the most talented person that you're going to see today or, you know, in the coming months as you decide who you want to take in. But I understand what you do. I think you guys make these uh, absurd, wonderful circuses, um, <laughs> visual, visual buffets of just like yeah. mayhem and, and wonder. And I, I want to be a part of it and yeah. I will be the hardest working, most eager to learn person that you've ever met. I know how to do this, this and this it was like sculpting, painting, you know, but uh, more importantly, I would be excited to do whatever would contribute to uh, the kind of projects that you guys make, which I think are really unique and I'm really excited about. So that was uh, that was the end of 2012 or the end of the school year 2012. So it was early 2012, I guess. And then, you know, I didn't hear for for a long for a long while. And uh, I was actually at Icon, which is an illustration uh, conference, and in it was New Mexico. in Rhode Island. Well, <laughs> oh no, it was, at Ro- it was in Rhode Island that year. Oh, whoops. And no, it's okay. The location changes. And, um, I was up there and about halfway through the week, uh, I got a call and they told me they needed me up there next week. And I was like, wow, I, I have to fly home right now because I have to pack up everything I own and move and move to Portland because my lease was ending and I had just finished school that month. So it was like, I'm not just going to go up and come back. I'm right. I'm going to go. I'm going to fully go. I came into Leica as an art intern and that was really great. They, you know, you're walking in as an intern, but they're in the middle of a production yeah. and maybe they, <laughs> kind of, yeah, like maybe they kind of knew you were coming, but they have things to do. And right. like, you're kind of, you know, uh, you might be a side note to that depending on the particular day. Right. <laughs> so <laughs> they were really great. And it was awesome. Like from the get go, like the first day there, uh, Kurt Enderly, who was the art director on the box trolls who I completely adore. He was uh, so good to me. But um, he walked us around the studio and he was showing us old sets from Paranorman. Oh my. It was so cool. It was like, I know intellectually what this is going to be. Like, I know what they do. I've watched the videos. I watched the making right. of stuff. I, I know that they hand make all these things and all of that. And you're like, I got this. I'm cool. I'm not going to freak out. It's going to be fine. <laughs> and then they bring you, <laughs> and then they bring you onto a set. Like, the library from Paranorman wow. or uh, like the outside of like the town hall area or whatever. I remember we got to the set with like the street and it was the destroyed, like after the street. Sorry if I'm spoiling anybody. In Paranorman, but <laughs> it's been a while. Uh, so I think it's okay. Yeah, yeah. The destroyed street from Blitz Hollow and the puppet of Norman is standing there in the middle of the street and wow. we walked up to it and Kurt goes, we're all standing there in wonder and nobody's touching anything. Cause we're all just like, this is a museum, right? You can't go near anything. And he was like, you know, you can get up there. Right. And we're all like, what? <laughs> what? <laughs> Cause it's like boosted. It's boosted up. Like right. they're up on these metal legs with these wood underpinnings. And uh, it's all super important that it doesn't move even uh, an inch, like a centimeter, right. <laughs> a micro centimeter. So it's, it's super stable, but it's also just so intimidating because every surface is like painted and meticulously put together. I mean, you've got people gluing individual little blades of grass and weeds and things into like little bits. It's, I can't even describe it. I don't even know. Even now, like I lived with it for two years. It like totally blows my mind that that stuff exists and that like people get to do that for a living. It's so cool. Yeah. But yeah, that first day was like better than any like Disney World, whatever. <laughs> like it was just, <laughs> it was fancy land, like everything you thought that Santa's workshop would be, but better because <laughs> uh, everything wasn't green and red right. everywhere. <laughs> But yeah, I, I don't, I don't even know how to describe it better than that, but it was so, so, so cool. And, um, everybody was really great, but they're also super busy. They're in the middle of the box trolls and, um, it was me and two other art interns and the art department at Leica means a lot of things. Um, you think about it, at least from my standpoint, because I was thinking about it as somebody who wants to design this stuff, I was thinking about, um, people designing the environments and designing, you know, props and characters and things like that. But 
you also have a lot of fabricators and people who specifically paint. So there's like the art department and you've got your art director and assistant art directors and the production designer and the design team and all of that. But then you've also got a scenic like painting department that paints all the sets. Right. And then you've also got like a landscape or greens department that does all of the greenery and the trees wow. and weeds and all those things. And then you've also got uh, the wood shop where they build all these things, they construct all these things. And um, then you've got the model shop, which is like assembling like all the little props little bits and doodads that go inside the sets. Right. And then uh, the casting shop, which is exactly exactly as it sounds. They've made these molds of all these things that are recurring parts like the roads and the box trolls of these cobbled streets, you oh, know. Oh, cool. And uh, there are these just big laid out blocks of silicone that you're, you know, you're casting those things uh, over and over and uh, I got to spend some time in the casting shop, actually, which is uh, wow. which is neat because I had done some sculpting, but I had never really done any casting. And uh, it was a lot of fun. Uh, Russell, the guy who was the head of that department uh, at the time that I was there, had worked on like Gremlins, too. And so, oh, wow. So, yeah. So we would talk about that stuff. Like so many of the people in that building have done such crazy things. Yeah. Like <laughs> they're just the best of the best right. fabricators, you know, and John Warren, who was the head of uh the like fabrication group over there is also incredible. He worked on, uh, in, in what is it? Insane killer clowns from outer space or whatever it was, <laughs> oh which is like so great. But yeah, so it's everybody that you talk to there has some crazy story about where they worked before the different things that they did. A lot of uh-huh. people, from Henson, that kind of stuff. Oh, so, man. and the whole place is like super workshoppy. Right. Again, that like Santa's workshop kind of thing. It's like, you can see pictures of it in a lot of the making of stuff uh-huh. from Leica, but walking through it, it's just, it's so neat because you see everybody at their little stations and um, there's a whole puppet department, of course, and everybody has these desks that are just overwhelmed, like different kinds of paint and uh, pencils and just anything and everything. And Kent Melton just sculpting. Wow. On the corner of the room. <laughs> just chilling. Yeah. If you guys don't know, he did... Um, Everything. He, everything. <laughs> uh, but the ones that I always think about are like from The Incredibles, like the Edna oh, yeah. Mode. Like, I just oh, I love those. But he is a huge uh, maquette maker, sculptor, um, who's done a lot of work with Disney and Pixar and does at least most of the hero characters for uh, for Lega. I think he's actually like retired other than that. I think that's he comes back just to do those and then he goes back home. He's also like the most generous guy in the world. I went up to him one day and just asked him. He had talked a little bit about making armatures in a talk that he had done with Damon Bard, who's another uh, really great sculptor. Oh, great guy. And that was a yeah, great guy. Um, and this was a talk done at, at CTNX, and I had just watched the video because I missed that year. But I just was asking him kind of how he goes about making an armature, thinking maybe we'd have like a two minute conversation about it. And I had really had to work myself up to go talk to him because I was so shy about it because he was so amazing to me. And uh, he spent about two hours with me walking me through exactly how he makes an armature for a specific character and then giving it to me down to like how he does the fingers and everything. I have it like it's around somewhere here. But um, yeah, it was like, what? (laughs) What is happening? Like, it's amazing how how many of those people like because they're all craftsmen and they're all excited about what they do and um, they're really excited to share it with you. So, do they cast Kent's sculptures and then articulate those, or do they have a separate set of puppet builders? There's the 2D designs, and then Kent sculpts, and then uh, we have uh, Toby Froud who also uh-huh. does some of the sculpts. And then I think Ben Adams does some of the sculpting as well. I apologize if they've added anybody since then, but yeah, so they do the sculpts and then um, they do uh, the armature separately. And then they, they cast the silicone or, or foam or, you know, it varies depending on character because they will construct these things toward what the character has to do, sure. which is all kind of negotiated between the puppet department and the animation, the animation department um, right. beforehand. Uh, but whatever the materials are, they they cast. Uh, it's like a Jesus pose where the arms are out and the legs are out, and uh-huh. they they cast around that armature. But uh, yeah, so it does come directly from those sculpts. But uh, before that, like when he does the maquette, the original maquette, uh, and they'll do a, they'll go through a lot of those to decide what the character's right. going to look like. And that's always a personality pose. Uh huh. Sure. To get as much life out of it as possible. And then they'll also take that and they'll cast it and they'll remake it. They, they'll remake that, uh, the final sculpt, for 
pretty much every department so that they know the scale and what it looks like and can use it as they make the other things. But then also the paint department in the, in the puppet area can start to test paints for the face and for the clothes and the costume department needs one. And yeah, so everybody ends up getting a copy of that actual final sculpt from Kent or from Toby or Ben or whoever. Wow. That's craziness. Yeah, it's it's complete madness, right? Because it takes months and months uh, to get to the actual puppet. And that's not including uh, figuring out the design, right? Uh, which takes, you know, its own time. But once you've got the design locked down, the actual uh, production of those things is incredibly timely, um, dark time consuming, rather. So they took volunteers to take tours to do the tours for like family and friends, everybody in the building was able to have so many people uh, come through. And if you wanted to, you could give the tours during a certain period of time when they had them open. And I volunteered as one of the people and it was like 20 of us. And the cool thing about that was that you, so you forfeit your lunch break to do it, but they, they get you lunch and it's fun to see people see all this for the first time. It's just a really, like there's a lot of joy in it. But cooler than that is you learn so much about the other departments because you have to be able to talk about them, at least to some extent, to people who are coming into it with no background knowledge at all. So I learned a lot. But one of the coolest aspects, uh, one of the cooler things that I that we learned about was the costumes, because number one, like having a dedicated costume designer is not that common just in animation in general. Um, A lot of times, like the character designer Right. what they've put on the character that is what it is and we have uh deborah cook who is um or just say they have and she's a dedicated costume designer um she does a ton of research it's all incredibly thought out based on character based on history and the box trolls in particular was just such a stunning display of what they're able to do. I mean, um, we have a laser cutter and I think that it initially was purchased as like something to help with the sets and all that. And it does, but what it's been able to do for the puppets department and the costume department is really astounding because you can take these fabrics and you can etch these tiny designs into them, which is amazing because, um, one of the things that you realize when you start to think about these things is like a piece of fabric, a regular piece of thread that I might use for my clothing on a screen, on a tiny puppet magnified maybe 70 times is going to look ridiculous right. <laughs> on a puppet. So they're having to generate their own fabrics. They're having to um, do all of this incredibly tiny detail work. And they're trying to keep everything uh, really true to history and make it feel like real fabric at real scale. So... Not only are the designs just incredible, and I and I love what she's done for the box trolls, but the engineering that has to happen oh yeah. inside the costumes because you've got to have an armature for the costume so that it moves um, an increment of a second at a time. I mean, uh, stop motion is, is 24 frames a second, so 24 clicks of the camera. So you've got to be able to move a pedal on the bottom of a dress you know, (laughs) incrementally, um, and have the rest of it stay. And you also like, you might have several copies of a main character. You might have like 28 copies of a main character. So, uh, they have to be exactly the same. They have to be worn in the same places. They have to move the same way. They have to, you know, everything. Yeah. So it's, it's, you really don't, you don't think about these things, but it's like, okay, how are we going to make chain mail? at that scale? And you end up like crocheting little bits of wire. Like, you know, it's like, Wow. That <laughs> That's is crazy. Amazing. It's so, so, so crazy. And you'd have to see it. You have to see it in person. It's the amount of craftsmanship, like um, one tiny specific little detail is like Snatcher, the main villain from the box trolls. What's great about Snatcher is that um, he's so garish. Yeah. He's this really over the top. Like he cares so much what everybody thinks about him. And he's so invested in status And, you know, he wants to be a gentleman. He wants to be taken seriously. He wants to be respected, all these things. And you can see in his clothes that that even with very little means that he's really trying to project this like distinguished, you know, tasteful, whatever. But it comes off so garish because he's it's too much everywhere, you know, and um, his socks are amazing. They're like (laughs) they're embroidered with these little like flowery, leafy kinds of I don't even know how to explain it, but it's like. There was one day where I had to go grab the puppet for something. We were te- checking the size for a door or a set or something. And I was a PA at that point, which we'll get into in a minute, I guess. But um, 
<laughs> I had to go get this puppet. And I looked down and I'm like, I have never noticed this, but I don't know how long it must have taken for them to like wow. do these individual little socks and maybe no one will ever see them. <laughs> you know, <laughs> Except it's like, you. <laughs> yeah, it's like, oh my God, I just want to write a sonnet to these socks, <laughs> which is, which is like the silliest thing ever. But yeah, so, um, that stuff just really, there's no getting used to it as you walk through that place every day, just kind of blows your mind. It's just the ultimate like dollhouse. Wow. It's amazing. Um, so yeah, so I, I got there as an art intern and, um, while everybody was wonderful and welcoming, they were super busy. And I think there was a day where we were supposed to like look at the portfolios and stuff. I think it was like the first day that we were there, but something happened and they had a meeting change and they had to do that. And, um, so we didn't do it. And, and my goal at that point was to make myself useful so that they would want to keep me <laughs> right. the, the internships three months. And you're like, okay, I got to be an asset. I got to find a way to figure out what's going on and be an asset to these people as quickly as possible. And it was tough. So um, I followed, I shadowed the uh, coordinator in the art department for a little while. So I got to go to meetings that I shouldn't have gotten to go to, but it was really, really cool to see how decisions are made. Like what is rain going to look like? What is smoke going to look like or whatever, which um, they do a lot of experimenting and so much goes into it. And um, I got a sense of how things worked. And as I was following him around, they would mention things like maybe, you know, I think one of them was like, um, oh, we got to go through the animatic and, and figure out in different scenes, like which parts of the truck move and how they move and like what parts of it we see or whatever. That's all like it's kind of a tedious process and everybody has like a full load already and it's hard to like find the moments to do that. And nobody had taken the job. Nobody had like grabbed it. So it's like, well. I'm just going to do it. And then, <laughs> and then hopefully like the more those little things come up, I can just grab them and like dig a little hole in the corner to where like, you know, I'm adding value. And so I started doing, doing things like that. And um, if you're unfamiliar, so animation, at, at least at like it, it does start with a script, but then um, there's a, the storyboards that then get cut into an animatic, um, which is representative of how the film will work. Um, they're kind of figuring everything out in that stage so that when they go to animate something, um, there's a real solid plan because you can't really just like redo the performance. You know, it's like you really need to have as much information and research um, into it as possible. So they're always really specific with the boards and making sure that everything is resolved. So going through the animatic is just going through the current cut of the film uh, sequence by sequence. And so I went through that and I made this like Excel document about when we see Snatcher's truck and like what parts of it we see. And cause all of that is you trying to figure out, uh, or how they would use it is to try and figure out how many of these trucks will we need to build? Will they all have to be full trucks or can we build like a partial over here? You know, cause right. you want to try to not overproduce cause that's going to cut into your timing and cut into your budget. So it's kind of a kind of an art and a science <laughs> right. trying for them trying to figure that out. So I started doing those kinds of things and they, they were really excited about that and it gave me a place to be useful. And uh, by the end of my three months there, I was very lucky in that the art director asked me if I, if I would be interested in staying around because he, he thought that I had done a good job while I was there. And I was really excited about that, but um, you know, they're well into the production and they don't have budget to add another person. So it was like, well, what are we going to do? And, um, they found a way to give me a second internship, which was awesome. And the internships there are, are paid. So it's not like I was, you know, right. Right. Um, hanging around doing stuff for free. So I was so excited to, to stay on for the additional three months. And by the end of that, I had carved enough of a, <laughs> enough of a hole and, and made myself useful enough that John Warren and, uh, Kurt Enderley, the art director and the, um, head of the art department were able to justify to the producer to add me as a PA. Uh, so then we had two PAs in the art department, which was such uh, a wonderful thing for them to do for me. And I was super grateful to get to stick around and learn more. That's great. And so uh, you just recently posted a bunch of your Box Trolls concept art on your blog. Yeah, that was, oh, I'm so excited that I was able to get that stuff so soon. But when I first got there, you know, we went through the story and I was uh, the art intern for a long time. And I tried to really focus on what I could do to help them with what they were doing right then. You know, I wasn't worried about what I was going to get out of it. And that was crucial 
um, to my success there and also just important because they needed help, you know, they needed it and, and it was fun and I learned so much. And, but after being a PA for a couple more months, I, I, um, had kind of a heart to heart with my art director, Kurt, um, who I worked uh, most directly with. And I asked him, um, you know, if, if there's anything that I could be doing or if there's anything, I would be happy to do it in my own time, but just to try to get my hand in the feel of like what it's like to do some illustration or, you know, design kind of work. And I remember him being surprised that I was a painter. He didn't know. And I thought, man, I really got to figure out a way to not be Jen the PA to get people to see like my value in other ways. If, if that's kind of what I want to do, I got to find a way that's not, that's not imposing. That's not pushy, you know, cause everybody's yeah. busy. Um, and so it's like, you have the thing that you want and you want people to be aware of that so that you have a chance of getting it, but you also don't want to uh, sabotage any of the production that's happening. Um, so I would look for opportunities and he was really, really open and wonderful about giving me opportunities. Um, in fact, the first couple of things that he had me do, because we hadn't brought on our graphic artist yet, uh, Josh Holtzclaw, who, uh, was a total godsend and, uh, did wonderful work on the box trolls. Um, but Kurt threw me a couple design, uh, challenges to do in my downtime that were like more graphic kind of stuff. And that was such a weak spot for me at that point. And I was really scared and I was also really caught up in trying to do what I thought they wanted. And I completely lost sight of my own ability to tell something was good. And I was just afraid. I was just terrified. You know, you got Paula Sane in the other end of the room and (laughs) just like, I can't, ah, you know, (laughs) and, um, I totally bombed. Like I, I did the things and Kurt was very kind about it. But in my mind, I was like, I psyched myself completely out of that. If they never give me something again, I would totally understand. And it took a little while before I was able to, to kind of get out of that. And, uh, yeah. And and it was the assistant, the assistant art directors, um, of which there were four on the box trolls were a great group of people. Rob Basu, Alice Bird, Phil Brotherton and Mary Blankenberg. Rob came to me with a problem of like, um, yeah, so there was this scene where they had um, all the box trolls kind of get in the stack. And the question was, how many of them are there? And like, (laughs) how's the stack going to look? And how much physical space does it take up? Because all those things go into like the construction of that environment. Right. And there are like, surprisingly, there are a lot of questions to that. Like, what is this big stack of boxes going to look like? And uh, so that was the first thing (laughs) that I because it seemed so much more technical and it seemed less like of an artistic thing, I was able to relax, I guess. And I found some extra time to not only make um, the model and, and do the mock-up in Photoshop, but I also like put the labels on the boxes and made them stylized, you know? So I made it more artistic than it needed to be, but it also helped the directors visualize what that was going to be a little more. And they actually got really excited about the stack of boxes idea. And then uh, that eventually turned into the poster, which was cool because I felt like, oh, yay. <laughs> like, oh, that's cool. They liked that. And that was great. Um, but that was the first thing that I did um, that I was like, oh, OK, I took like a little bit of what I know about how to make art and put into that. And that worked. And um, things just kind of kept edging more that direction as that would happen. Kurt would always be really responsive to me wanting to put in extra time or try out different things. And I was just really, really lucky to have people who were okay (laughs) with me kind of jumping in and trying to, um, trying to do some stuff. And, and the directors were really, really great as well, because I had done some things, you know, to do with that pile of boxes that had escalated into me doing like a, basically a color, um, like look dev piece for that scene. And then, they were at my desk and we were talking about something else, but they had added this prologue sequence and I was sitting there and it was like, well, we're going to do this. Well, we're going to have to somebody have somebody do that. And I was like, could I try? <laughs> do you guys mind <laughs> yeah. if I just like try it out? And, um, they were, they were really nice. Like Kurt said, yeah, I mean, just give it a shot. Like worst thing that happens, you know, yeah. we'll, We'll pass off somebody else. But it was great because uh, when you're trying to come up, it's like you don't want to steal somebody else's task. Right. 
because you don't want to take their fun or their opportunity or whatever. But this hadn't been assigned to anybody and it was nobody's yeah. nobody's thing yet. And I had done enough stuff at this point that they were willing to to give me a minute to try it out. So I did and I worked with Kurt uh, really closely on it and it ended up being the look development and the color scripts for the prologue of the film. Wow. Yeah, which was a lot more graphic, uh, just a little different than than the rest of the show and uh, definitely the most like responsibility and most exciting thing. <laughs> like I was totally uh, baffled to to get to do any of that kind of stuff and, and uh, thrilled beyond the telling of it. So I did that stuff and um, we were excited about it and they were kind enough to put the first image that I did, which was a uh, fish running through the alley with baby eggs. It's the first page in the art book. And when I saw that, <laughs> I just cried. I just immediately just water streaming down my wow. face. Cause it was like such a dream come true. So yeah, I, I was really, really uh, lucky and excited to have people who were excited to, to create opportunities for me to show what I could do. That's amazing. Yeah. And they're really great. You know, in that building, one of the best things about it is um, a lot of the people there, they think a little outside, uh, if that makes sense. Like <laughs> A little? <laughs> a little, yeah. <laughs> yeah. I mean, they're always looking for ways to turn, like we were talking about earlier, a piece of cardboard into, you know, a downtown cityscape or, you know, whatever <laughs> crazy thing. Like they're looking at things and seeing the potential in them. And that is a really cool thing to be around. Um, yeah, I'll bet. Yeah. There, I, when, I went, when I was a PA, before I got into uh, being able to make more art, like towards the end, I was making a lot of art, which is really, really uh, cool. And I actually had a little more time to do it because the PA tasks were slowing down as the film was slowing down. And so I was, I was afforded the time. But in the beginning, there was so much artwork going on around me and it was it was really inspiring, but it was also, I think Sarah talked about this as well. It was also agitating in a way. It was like, it was like being thirsty and being surrounded by water. Ah, uh, wow. But you can't drink it. It was this ultimate tease, you know, and over time, like in the beginning, it was all inspiration. I was so excited. And then, you know, after about a year, something like that, it became this, this itch. I think she described it as an itch that she couldn't scratch. And I, I, I completely identify with that. And so I was like, okay, I got to start finding room to make some of my own stuff in my own time. And one of the things that I started doing was portraits of the people in the studio, uh, in the art department, because there were a couple on the wall, but it, they were from Paranorman and the cast of people in the room had changed. And I started doing these portraits and they were, um, just these little things done in art rage. Actually, I think I still have them on my blog, but, or on my, um, portfolio site, but, um, I pinned them on the wall in the art department and um, Nelson Lowry, who was the supervising production designer at Leica and also was the production designer on um, Paranormal, uh, came through and he saw them. And um, I have to explain that this guy is somebody that I was always so intimidated by, not because he's a scary figure, but because he's so incredible. <laughs> like <laughs> he worked on Fantastic Mr. Fox and oh. Side, and he's just amazing you know and he did paranormal and he you know he's just he's somebody that you just know there's like he's he's got to be so busy but you just would kill for 15 minutes with him you know just to pick his brain and right he saw those portraits and asked who did them and came over to my desk and it's like oh you know I, I love those portraits that you did are they gouache are they whatever and we had this like two second conversation but I remember when he walked away thinking like, what is my face doing? What is my face doing? So it's like, <laughs> it was like, I hope that I just acted like a human person because I feel right now, like I am going to just fall off this chair, uh, which is so nerdy, but I'm, I'm just, I'm kind of like that where I just get overwhelmed with emotion. And I, and I was in that moment. And, um, that night I had gotten home from work and I was like, you know what? I should, I should paint a portrait of him. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Okay. I'm going to, I'm going to do this. Hopefully it'll come out good and he won't hate it. <laughs> and so I painted him <laughs> and I sent it to him and he loved it. And he invited me to come show him uh, more of my work. And I did. And he was really positive. Like he really liked stuff mm. that I showed and um, was just a really 
really a great person to talk to because it made me feel like my goals were accessible to have confirmation from somebody like this that like, oh yeah, what you're doing is cool. Like it's, I like it. I'm responding to this. And it was one of those moments that made me want to work and really fight for yeah. it because yeah, because having that positive reinforcement. So he has been completely um, a great positive force for me as far as um, moving forward. Cause I think that he is probably one of the best people at being able to see outside of what you're already doing to what that could be turned into. Hmm. I don't know if I know anybody else who can do that. Like he can do it. Um, I've worked with him on several things. Now I have worked with them um, on some development projects um, because he brought me in because he yeah. uh, is wonderful and believed in my work. And um, I've never worked with somebody who, you show them something and a lot of times uh, maybe I'll send them just a JPEG of what I'm doing or whatever. And five minutes later I might have a Photoshop file or just another JPEG where he is like broken the whole thing down and totally rearranged it and added this and that. And it's like a hundred times better (laughs) than what I had done. And it always blows my mind. It's always like, wow, idiot. What was I doing? This, (laughs) this is the thing. And it's like, Usually you work with people and even if you have a great art director, you're going to disagree with them sometimes or sure. like, yeah. whatever. That, that's just kind of how it goes. But man, Nelson, at this point, like everything he says, I'm like, oh, my God. Yeah. Yeah, <laughs> obviously. So it's it's such a joy to work with him. And I'm not sure if it's because like my tastes align with his to uh, that degree right. or what it is. But um God, I just, I love working with him because every time I work with him, I know two things. It's going to be amazing and it's going to be terrifying (laughs) because he's always asking you to do something that is something you've never done or something that, yeah, it's always a huge risk that you're taking. You're always doing something out of the box or something, you know, that might not work, (laughs) that might fail disastrously. Uh Yeah. (laughs) And that is an exciting thing. It's really inspiring. I love working with him. Wow. So, yeah, I mean, uh, the Box Shoals was an incredible um, experience for me, and I'm, I'm so happy to be able to, to show that work now. It's, it's something that I'm really, really proud of uh, to have as my first project, for sure. And then after that, um, wrapped on Box Shoals, and uh, I was actually kind of thinking I would go back into, like, work mode and, like, work on my own stuff for a little while. That was oh, kind of my right. plan. Yeah, you were talking yeah. about doing a book. <laughs> Right, right, right. And I'm like starting to make all these plans. And then um, this is the funniest, uh, the funniest thing. I got this email out of nowhere about Puss in Boots. And it was the, you know, the TV version that they're doing for Netflix for DreamWorks that's being uh, designed up in Vancouver, BC. When I saw the email, like my first reaction was, oh, that can't be right. And also Canada, I can't move to Canada. (laughs) So I kind of was like, ah, you know. And then um, Florian, the the main guy up at Bardell, just kept emailing me. And I was like, well, I can't, man, Puss in Boots. And I went back and looked at the art book. And it's like Paula Sane again, who's amazing. Yeah, yeah. Marcos, who I absolutely yeah. love. You know, Nathan Fox, who, yeah. Oh. So, you know, I'm looking at this book and I, I go back and watch the movie. And I'm like, how do I, I got to I gotta do this, you know. And uh-huh. it was cool because I, um, I got to work with uh, Corey Heinzen, who was the creative director on the show. And, um it was really fun because it was like, um, I can't talk too much about right. the show itself and the content, but there were some specific things in the main environment that really needed to be figured out and kind of developed and it has a unique style. And uh, I got to be a big part of creating that uh, with Corey. And it was it was really fun. I'm, I'm really excited to see how it all comes together. I know that they're trying to really push the medium you know, of TV um, They'd have into to. something. Yeah, they have to, yeah. to do Puss in Boots because it's so oh, absolutely. highly rendered. Yeah, and the work that's being done, uh, there's a team of six artists up in Vancouver um, doing the work, and it's it's amazing looking stuff, like just gorgeous. Um, and that's, yeah, it's such a realistic, very detailed world. Um, but they're really, they're really killing it. I'm excited to see how the show looks when it comes out. Um, so that was really fun. And, uh, we wrapped with that recently and I came back down to Portland. Are you, are you allowed to talk about what 
the next art thing is yeah you, I, yeah yeah <laughs> so um yeah um i'm uh just signing actually right now i think i have the contracts in my inbox as we speak with a new illustration agency, which is going to be really exciting. I'm going to be working with a friend, which is always wonderful, um, Ryan Sanchez, who uh, I was a student of his in some of his first classes at SCAD. And um, he's an illustrator in his own right and a professor, but he is starting this boutique agency. And it's um, just a couple people that he knows that he believes in their work. And I'm very lucky to consider myself one of those people. As he, as he always talks about it is, uh, you know, we don't want to take over the whole world. We're not greedy, but just, you know, a little part of it. We're just going to kind of yank that <laughs> and take that for ourselves, put a little flag in the ground. So um, it's called <laughs> Spinning Yarn. It's his agency. It's it's cute. It's actually named after um, Captain Kangaroo, this little segment of like stories <laughs> that they would do. He showed me the, he showed me the video. It's like, the cutest thing ever. <laughs> but yeah, it's, it's called Spinning Yarn and it's, it's really cool. I've I've been watching him kind of put together the site and the real like mission statement of the agency. And I'm just so thrilled because last time I had talked to him before we had decided to do this was at Icon this year. And he knew that I was talking to a couple different agents because I've been looking for a long time. You know, we talked about books like I, I am really interested in, in maybe trying to do some kids book stuff or just get back into something where I'm. Um, yeah creating artwork on my own to see what that looks like. Cause I don't even, I'm not sure right, right. now. So I'm really excited um, to be working with somebody who, who believes in what I'm doing and knows my work so well and to do some different kinds of projects. I think it's gonna be really, really fun. Of course, I'm still hopefully going to be doing some animation stuff. I, I do uh, freelance work, development work with Leica sometimes. And I'm really excited about 2015 uh, and, and getting back to making my own stuff. Well, Jen, I couldn't be more excited. Just so, so excited about these new creative endeavors and uh, what's coming next for you as an artist. I'm excited about your blog. I love your blog posts. I, I feel like I haven't read an artist's blog in a long time that I was that sort of moved and, and inspired by. It's just amazing oh, all you. the stuff you have going on. It's it's very, very exciting. Thanks very much. Yeah, I um, uh, made that decision this year to start trying to put some of that stuff down, even though writing is a little intimidating for me. So that means a lot. Thank you very much. That's great. Well, uh, next time I see you, if we could go out for an emu burger, I'd be, uh, I'd be really happy <laughs> about track that. Some down. We may have to go down to Texas. <laughs> okay. Deal. <laughs> I'll meet, I'll meet you in Austin. Perfect. Oh, that's perfect. Oh no, Dallas. Sorry. I'll meet you in Dallas. I was, was going to say emu tacos <laughs> if you're going down to Austin. Oh, emu. <laughs> <laughs> After listening to Jen talk about Leica, I went to the art store and bought four pounds of Super Sculpey. <laughs> it's great for developing character designs, by the way, even if the final art ends up being digital. But my question for you is, have we lost touch with the power of tactility? What is it about handmade art that is so inherently appealing? Go to chrisoatley.com forward slash je2, as in Jen Ely and the number two, and share your thoughts in the comments. And be sure to check out Jen's super inspiring Tumblr blog at jenniferely.tumblr.com. That's J-E-N-N-I-F-E-R-E-L-Y dot tumblr.com. This podcast is a production of the Oatley Academy of Concept Art, Illustration, and Visual Storytelling. I'm Chris Oatley, your host and producer. Our editor is Kevin Chandler. Production support was provided by Travis Bond and Anya Marcos. Our theme music is provided by Storybook Steve. Recurring musical segments are provided by Storybook Steve and Kangaralian. We are a proud member of the Visual Voice Podcasting Network, and you can find all of our available shows at chrisoatley.com forward slash shows. Emu burgers. Emu burgers. Why is that so hard to say? Emu burger. Emu burger.